share you know, some of her uh, insights of that public survey we had about planning of on fiber and she uploaded it on my folder so you can check that uh, documents to you know more about how we have done uh, with the police outside of the for, for the case of uh, planning. And okay, so we go to the stage three, so we have stage one and stage two, the proposal and the opinion. Then we move on after we have to like the uh, general uh, collect the opinions from the general public we use police, for example, as uh, Uber. Then we move on to stage two, third, stage three, uh, reflections. And this is when uh, we hold a consultation meeting. So after a round or several rounds of opinion collection, we have raw reports generated, for example, as in the case, generated by uh, with the list uh, of that opinion collection. And some of the facilitator and as a number of case, the facilitator did have a secondary uh, study or like a interpretation of that report. So uh, we have and also at the proposal stage we have some of the documentation or paper or represent, uh, presentation from company authority. So based on all these materials, so and if the company authority and contributor think they are ready, so we can move on to the consultation meeting. And this of course has to be uh, thoroughly discussed and in hackathon. And the preparation for the consultation meeting. Uh, so first of all, if if the mini uh, if the facilitator hasn't been involved earlier, so then this is the like the deadline that the facilitator really needs to be engaged, and we can have some candidate suggestion from um, a company and authority, or if the contributors of mini hackathon have some candidates that they can have a discussion about who we should, uh, who would be, who would be suitable for hosting this facilitation meeting. And also need to, uh, the contributor to a mini hackathon has, has to discuss with the company and the party about the scope of the issue. Because we really need to focus on, uh, and we let, I guess the idea may be a little bit diverge and the opinion collection, so we need to um, try to narrow down the scope and to be more focused. Especially we have to host like an inter-sustainable meetings. And so we have, to, and also need to synchronize with the uh, facilitator. So we may have a pre-meeting with the facilitator and a competent authority. Let these two, um, let, let them be on the same page to make sure that they are on the same track. And uh, the pre-meeting has to be at least one week prior to the consultation meeting. So that one week is, one week. according to our experience, that might be enough of the time to do the preparation. And so here are some things to do. Some might be a little bit trivial, but this is what we uh, have what we do to prepare for a consultation meeting, like the rundown of the meeting and the agenda. And we will also set up uh, a registration page. We, and we use Pick and Fix. It's a registration page. Uh, oh, I think I'm right, yeah. Uh, so to promote our event, we will use the link of the registration page to spread the news at the, the event. And also, as the rule is that only the invited speaker as guests and the registered and the participants who have made contribution, who have made contributed contributions before can attend. So this is another rule of uh, in Taiwan. And we have the seating plan. I see you now. Please sit in. Um, and also, uh, the equipment this year. Uh, we will have a stenographer to help us do the transcripts. So we will uh, make sure that we have a full documentation, uh, documentation of the whole consultation meeting. And one nice 
thing about transparency and documentation is that because all the materials are uploaded on the internet, so we have like a URL for each material. And it's quite easy compared with sending the actual files. We only need to send out the materials by URL. Like we uh, have the URL in invitation letters, press release, and on the registration page. So it's quite easy and um, an easy access for them to to these um, materials. So this is uh, yeah, one nice thing about putting everything online and so that everyone can check them easily. So the setup. Um, so here's the uh, one of the agenda. This is a NCI place, the non-consensual intervention place. So we have this standing uh, agenda poster sitting uh, we'll put it at the entrance, and it shows the title of the meeting, the agenda of the meeting timetable, and the, the flow of the uh, Coastal Solution meeting is that we have reception first, and then we let them introduce themselves, and let them, um, just like you guys did uh, yesterday, just let people know how we like to be called, so that uh, the, the stenographer can uh, have your name and you would prefer uh, name to be documented in the transcript. And also, that, and then the facilitator will have a presentation about uh, the process of the beta one and what has been done and what, what kind of materials or uh, online opinion production has been done. And then the corporate authority might have also a, a presentation to, to present their uh, have their use status or their position about a specific topic. And then we go into the interactive discussion and that's the, this is the, like the highlight of the consultation meeting. And the facilitator will control the flow of conversation throughout the whole meeting. And then uh, after, based on these discussions, the facilitator will also come to an end and draw the conclusion so this is the uh, example of our meeting flow. And this is just like a side story of the NCI case. Because uh, we have, we not only have, not only have the uh, seating agenda, but we also have a banner just to put it behind the facilitator. So the facilitator will be sitting at the bottom of the U shape. And then, so this we set a live stream. So when the camera, uh, points at uh, the seal paper, was, the banner will be shown behind the seal paper. But as uh, in the NCI case, because this is the first version of Y1 is the first version, and this, here's the second version. So do you see, yes? The icon. The, the icon, in this one? Yeah. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> So the first version, because we have all sorts of uh, the design of this banner, and the first version, so it apparently, uh, the, the blue one just representing male as a predator, and the pink representing female as a victim, and it's just not uh, right in terms of gender. So to change it into color purple, which might be more gender neutral, yeah, so this is just a side story to how we should be more careful about our design of the, the, mater uh, the materials or the decoration materials for the meeting. Okay, so here's the layout of the meeting room. Um, so this is the uh, projector screen, so like now you are all sitting as the new shape. So the facilitator I will be sitting here, so that will be where Audrey will sit. sit. Um, yeah, so, so here's the uh, government. Right. And professor. And here is the civil society and the business or private, private sector. And there are also a group of online. <laughs> Participants <laughs> will not be showing 
person, but yeah, they can choose to stay anonymous or they can also show their identity if they choose to. Uh, yeah, and then we'll post their comments on Slido later as an experiment to show. Yeah, so this is the sitting plan and it's quite interesting. This is, we set it up as a new shape so that we can see each other's faces, like uh, facial expression. Uh, so just let people get to see each other. And the walls are, outside registration is not welcome. So as I said, we only we send out invitation letters and we only welcome those in person. Uh, we welcome those who have contributed before to be present <coughs> at the consultation meetings. But if they haven't contributed before, they can, they can still watch live stream uh, video and post their own comments. And one of the mis mission of the facilitator is that he or she has to bring in insightful and valuable opinions from the online chapter. So that this is where and when uh, the physical and virtual space uh, sort of mix together. So uh, the facilitator will play as a channel between the physical and virtual. And the method, uh, this is just uh, one of um, facilitation style that we can carry. Uh, we can we can use is a it's called focus conversation method, or also known as or ID. Or representing objective. R is reflective. I is interpretive and D is decisional. So um, objective is uh, facts and data. So here's. Um, an example that we tell is a project, so it's a fact and it's objective. And and I think we tell is a great project, so it becomes a uh, emotion or a feeling, and it's a reflective one. And we tell is a project that should expand. That's like an opinion, or value, so it's interpretive. And decision also that's when decisions and consensus happen. Like we conclude that we concluded that we tell expands within a month. So. People might express different kinds of opinions, feedbacks, uh, comments, ideas, all sorts of. So this is uh, all sorts of um, statements, and this is just a, a, su uh, a suggestion that we can try to categorize these about a variety of statements into these four categories to help you think more objectively. So. ORID, as I said, it's just a recommendation approach to help the facilitators set up to hold a natural ground and to set a, 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 a neutral ground to set a neutral mindset. Yeah. And um, here are some statements that are translated into English uh, in NCI case. But I don't think we have that much of time, but um, so uh, it, it needs some practice to, okay, for, for example, like this, a shorter one. The legislation can serve the purpose of telling people this is an act of crime. So um, this can be uh, categorized as interpretive. So it's a kind of a key in. So, um, yeah, so this is just an example to show you. Um, so after all these statements, we need a other work to show us the art of the facilitation. So we have to, after several rounds of discussion, we need to try to find a way to reach raw consensus. We need to uh, try to locate where the raw consensus is. And uh, yeah, so this is an example from the CI case. So we can move on to uh, government. So we have so many government. Sorry, the color blue. Are you green? Is that green? Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
We can hire a scholar. We <laughs> <laughs> got the budget for it. <laughs> what, what, what we're going to do is really just role playing because um, there is no three weeks worth of post data to work with. So this is mostly just to get you in the feeling of a consultation meeting. This is not a real consultation meeting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but, but I mean, um, but more seriously um, speaking, um, what in the beginning of a consultation meeting, uh, what we always do is we first honor, uh, well, the, the nation and the lands that we inhabit on, but also honor the public conversation uh, that has uh, preceded before. So we always um, open whatever consultation that we had online uh, and acknowledge the civil society members who took their time to participate online and give us valuable contributions so uh, that you're invited here uh, today face to face to elaborate uh, on your ideas um, online. And we would then also honor whatever groups that has been formed because we will not actually go into the divisive comments. We agree to only hold our the agenda to the consensus statements. So it's important to acknowledge our differences first. So that is, again, what the facilitator does first. Like, um, we understand that there are nine people. It, it's actually usually not 100, but you know, bear with me. <laughs> we understand that there are nine people here yeah, that, that feels um, that they love ride-sharing services. They're so convenient and inexpensive. And we understand that 1,200 people doesn't think this way. And we uh, acknowledge this uh, sentiment. We also acknowledge the sentiments of the other group. For example, like Uber drivers should be licensed exactly like taxi drivers, or that uh, the Uber um, should contribute to infrastructure payments to keep the road maintained. That could be through taxes or some methods. And this is uh, not exactly uh, a, a popular sentiment, although it is still over majority in the Uber loving uh, segment. So we also want to acknowledge this uh, somewhat divisive, but not entirely divisive um, idea. And so, uh, starting by reading through the, the defining characteristics of groups, which used to be, uh, in real world, much more polarized than this, <laughs> then we move on to the actual consensus statements, which is generated automatically by the police system. So as you're uh, filling in the police, we then also say that, you know, 24 people voted, all 700 votes, results into this shape, which always let, let us see that there's more consensus than divisive statements, and that everybody agrees on these majority issues. And so we put ourselves um, to the agenda of going through those um, consensus issues and asking the scholars, uh, especially, uh, to elaborate or to pr provide their input on how to move forward, since these are clearly what people have all agreed with in their sentiment as important moving forward. Uh, and so then, the, as a facilitator, I would then um, switch to the prepare slides, uh, which will highlight uh, each one as a separate slide. But because this is real-time generated, so bear with me, I'll just use this anyway, uh, which is a screenshot. And so people think, generally, that sharing economy is a trend. So the government should adapt the regulations instead of banning every sharing economy service. And we can see almost everybody is fine with this sentiment. Uh, and that people want to know upfront how much uh, that they are charged. So uh, I would uh, like to ask um, the Uber representative here whether this is actually already the case. Uh, and in, in that uh, role, maybe you, the Uber people can just uh, speak a simple yes or no question, like whether this is already the case. Uh, and yes, it is. So, okay, so, so, um, so people's feelings are acknowledged in the current operation in Uber. Uh, and also people um, want to know, and yeah, you want to make a comment, please? Oh, I'm yeah. from the taxis, though. Oh, you're from the taxis, go ahead. And the, the charge up front isn't possible in our current business model. Okay, so by the mile, you mean the current yeah. mileage. Because we charge by time and mileage, so you mm -hmm. can't go that before it starts. Yes. So we understand that. Uh, so the people would like to know up from like how much they might be ch charged. So that may be an interesting uh, conversation to have. 
like like if they know already the destination, uh, how can the civil service and the academics contribute to the possibility of the passenger know approximately what will be the rate uh, when they arrive at the destination? And that may be an interesting thing for the taxi operators to have uh, as a tool for the passenger, uh, because that's what people feels like that they would like to know. Uh, and then and people feel that there needs to be regulation and accountability to protect the personal safety of vulnerable passengers. Uh, and that people feel that ride sharing, uh, ride sourcing should be better integrated into the public transit system like the existing metro system and these systems. And finally, that there should be some safety training standards. So the um, uh, proceeding sequence is usually, we start with the academics, who look at those common sentiments. Usually they have weeks to do preparations <laughs> and, and to, to elaborate uh, their views on a more holistic or more systemic um, or structural uh, issue concerning those common sentiments. Uh, but because this is just a mock consultation, so just speak whatever that comes on your mind. <laughs> and we'll ask um, and any of those professors uh, to share with us some insights to open the stage of the consultation. You think that in the education system, everybody should care, uh, should learn how to work with vulnerable um, population, not just when they become passengers. That's a very valuable insight. Thank you. Um, and so, um, does the civil society, the people who presented those sentiments after uh, hearing this analysis and the you know initial framing, uh, do you think that there's anything missing uh, in this picture? Is there any particular point you would like to bring? That's within this conversation. Uh, I would like to suggest yes. that we currently have regulations for taxis yes. which require them to carry certain um, safety equipment yes. and roads. Um, in some jurisdictions there are shields which are behind the, the driver's um, head so that they can't be attacked from behind by a passenger. Okay. Um, and I, uh, I wonder if there might be some opportunity to regulate requirements for similar equipment in uh, Okay, uh, and, the, and the reason is to protect the drivers. Okay, uh, are there any other input from the civil society? 
So um, just to check everybody's understanding, everybody understand what surge pricing means? Okay, good. Um, so any, anything from the civil society uh, side before we turn over to the taxis and Ubers uh, to answer? Okay, <laughs> yeah, so, um, so just factual um, check. Uh, so the cameras and the shielding protection, is it part of regulation in the taxi industry? Uh, for taxis, yes. yes, okay. yes. And is it, does it protect the uh, drivers? Uh, um, we have found that yes, it does, especially the shields. Um, the cam was it cameras? Yeah. Was the same piece? Cameras <laughs> are a newer piece. We don't have any data yet to see if those have actually made any difference. But for sure, the shields have made it, um, especially for our, our drivers, it's made it a much safer environment, especially during night shifts. Okay. Um, does Uber have anything to approach? It would be interesting to see the stats. Like, have any incidents that are actually different between taxis and Ubers? The stats that we have <laughs> are that the levels of safety are pretty much, there's the incident levels between taxis and Ubers. Okay, uh, so that is for the for the shield uh, suggestion. Yeah. But do you, um, do you want, uh, do you have any regulations or you, do you have any trainings uh, for the drivers to improve their own safety or to care about passengers? Do you give the um, drivers you know, essential trainings as the people's will <laughs> here obviously care about? No. Um, <laughs> but that would add you know, considerable cost for our business models. We also work with um, the Uber Taxi So the main concern is the, the budget yeah, that it would cost the, 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 <laughs> the your partners uh, to install these yeah. uh, equipments. Yeah. Um, what are cameras for anyway? Are, are they catching the road on the traffic or the inside or where are they pointed? I don't know. They were regulated upon us. We're not really sure why. Oh, really? So if, if there's any people from the public sector knows about this camera <laughs> <laughs> installment um, you know, requirements. Okay. Okay. Why is that? I see. Okay, so maybe it records the, the traffic says nearby and also to some degree activities uh, in the driver's um, seat. Is that the idea? Yeah. Or passenger behavior interaction yeah, with, the, with the driver. And uh, are there minimum uh, requirements of like the quality of the camera or, or things like that in the current regulation or just you know any simple cam they do? It just just make something else. And how much does it cost anyway? Just make something. <laughs> okay, so it's about. Just pick something up. <laughs> okay. Right, right, right. So, so, so say it's say, say it's two hundred. Uh, yeah. And and so th does Uber consider this to be too expensive for your partners? So our structure of ensuring security is different because taxis rely on anonymous rider and usership, but actually everyone who enters like Uber has a name, we you know their information. So we don't really need the video because we have a way of capturing who they are. And if any of these things do come down, like we would have the exact same information mm -hmm. that the camera would provide. Mm -hmm. So okay. we already structured it into our model. Okay. Um, so just uh, for, yes. Uh, there's a online input that says the cameras are installed. Uh, actually, it's focused on the road and not within uh, the cabin itself uh, to protect the privacy anyway. So that is a clarification from an online correspondent. And, and yes, 
Uh, so please. Uh, thank you for that one line. <laughs> I don't have to explain that anymore, as I was definitely going to. Um, <laughs> I'd like to just focus on the, the safety piece here that Cooper is bringing up. Um, they've vastly um, misrepresented the amount of safety and the amount of liability Uber currently takes upon itself. Um, the taxi industry has been self-regulating all these safety concerns for quite a while and uh, following all the regulations that have been placed upon us. Uber has gone above and beyond to make sure that um, any current regulations don't need to be followed, mainly because as far as their business model is concerned, they're not the ones causing the damage or the problems because they can consider all of their drivers to be um, independent contractors in this way. So a lot of the data they do have is usually when they get caught, not when it's reported. Whereas we have systems in place to make sure that reporting is followed through on and is reported to proper authorities. Yeah. Would you like to elaborate a little bit more on the reporting structure that you currently have? Like if a passenger or a driver notices an incident, how's it done? Yeah, so all of our drivers are licensed, um, they all go through training, and there is a number for each of them inside our cabs, so that people can contact if there are issues. Um, we're also rolling out uh, panic buttons in the back if okay. there are issues, and we already have that for most of our taxi drivers in the front. Um, so we have an entire system, an entire uh, uh, group, within, not for any of the individual taxi companies, but more for the, the, the independent body set up for that, to make sure that um, we do have recourse, both for passengers and for drivers, mm -hmm. when it comes to um, issues such as any dangerous situation that's come up. Whereas uh, with Uber, just based on the fact that they don't consider the drivers to be employees, um, that really, really helps them to screw around the law and never address any of these issues fully, other than perhaps reimbursement of rides, which really helps with the trauma. Right, so the, the panic buttons uh, that uh, you said is being rolled out for both uh, passengers and drivers. Um, so the, does the civil society here have any input into like whether it makes you feel safe or have you had any incidents or personal experience? of uh, using the taxi service and, and, and things like that? Like, do anyone have any personal experience to share around this design of the reporting and, uh, you know, um, escalation <laughs> uh, uh, mechanism that taxis? Do anyone has any personal taxi stories to tell? So just to check my understanding, uh, you feel that um, the company line and the uh, um, Uber Hazard app are both safer uh, from hailing uh, on the road. Is that what I'm hearing? That is correct. Okay. Uh, any other inputs from the civil society? No? Okay. Right. So um, let's go back to the public sector. Uh, so uh, assuming that you're the regulatory uh, agency, um, do first before we go back to the regulators. Do anyone has any factual, um, like people say that it's all between 4.6 and 4.8 stars, uh, and the other things that's brought up so far? Any factual sharings or amendments? Yes. So uh, I'm an economist and legal scholar from the Uber Institute. 
There's a follow-up question from online uh, participants to you. Um, like, is there enforcement around uh, after a panic button is pushed? Um, how does the mechanism work? And is there a follow-up? Like, uh, after the incident is handled, uh, do you actually go back to check with the taxi company and or the individual taxi driver on the, you know, how they resolve these issues, incidents, and earlier about uh, how, uh, you know, 4.62, 4.8 stars, and that's because, you know, drivers that falls below a certain threshold, below 4 stars, uh, they are not allowed to drive uh, with Uber anymore, uh, and I think that's the uh, clarification from the Uber Institute. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, um, is that true? Is that uh, the case? Um, is the Uber here? Uh, well, yeah. So we assume that it's true, and this is a mock facilitation anyway. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. Uh, so like, if they fall below four star, they're actually disqualified uh, from driving anymore, which is why we don't see three star drivers. Uh, yes. Well, it's true in Taiwan, but <laughs> it's true. Okay, so um, just to, to check uh, everybody's understanding, we have uh, clarified quite a few things about um, number uh, 34, how existing safety training standards work uh, to some degree, and we also <coughs> understand the government uh, has regulations for both camps and panic buttons, but they are used in a privacy-preserving way, and the government only has the aggregate numbers instead of you know follow through on individual case-by-case uh, -case basis. And we also understand that Uber says that uh, the app itself or the phone itself um, carries certain identity about passengers, so that if there is any conflicts and so on, the passenger uh, will be identified, and it's easier uh, to enforce to some degree. Um, to uh, identify the person uh, actually making the call, and we also have at least one passenger saying that uh, using the app and using the you know company line to dial in taxi 
both actually makes them feel safer compared to hailing a street uh, car. And I think that's kind of common sentiment before we move on to the ideation stage. Uh, does anyone have anything that's facts or personal experience to add to our current understanding? Yes. equally uh, across all drivers yeah so all drivers get trainings and empowered to understand the whole situation about emission social environment okay that, that's an excellent addition yes So uh, by even higher standard, do you mean that it's set by the public sector or by the union or by your association? Like where does this higher standard come from? It just seems that um, if, if one side has been made to uh, bring it to a higher standard for both emissions testing and driver capability and stuff, then the other side should also be either brought to that same level or the current standard is relaxed a little bit. If we're like willing to trust the, the standard level of quality for all vehicles. Mm -hmm. So is it uh, a, a factual thing that taxi drivers are currently held to a higher emission standard compared to, uh, no? Okay. Uh, it's just a training standard. Vehicle quality as well, the testing on the vehicles? Well, it's actually, just sorry, point of Oh yeah, thank you, yes, th thank you, Professor. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> from science, uh, from science. So be before we move on to ideation, uh, there is also a online question to ask the academics here. Um, do uh, did any of you uh, are aware of comparative literature that uh, across other countries, perhaps about higher training standards? The one that was just pointed out by the taxi association here actually results, um, you know, to better safety levels. Uh, how is the cor correlation done? Is there any? Um, data or literature that uh, we can consult uh, maybe after this meeting? Uh, you know, yes? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, okay, that's great, that's great. So after the meeting, please, please do uh, provide maybe citations or uh, the name of the, the papers uh, to our collaboratively notes uh, so that people online, they feel very interested uh, in studying these and also contributing their views uh, to, to the research that you're doing. Uh, okay, great. So um, I think everybody is more or less on the same page. Uh, now we can move on to um, ideation. And so it, it seems to me, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that the, the main um, kind of contention point here is that um, the, what people cares about, which is um, the safety levels, uh, is enforced at the moment differently, uh, but um, somewhat also effectively according to the, the objective feelings and evidences here. And people wonder uh, whether 
um, the uh, safety standards that is uh, mostly actually just training, like hours of training or whatever, uh, to taxi drivers. Uh, the taxi people would like to know whether they could be lowered, is that the, the idea? Uh, like, like 50 hours instead of, I don't know, 100 hours, I don't actually remember the numbers here. But, uh, but for, for this kind of, and I think that's one uh, question for the ministries to consider, I think it's a important point. And the other thing is that people want to know upfront how much uh, they might be charged, which is, as the taxi here said, it's difficult uh, to do. Uh, if you only know the beginning point and the end point, um, at the moment there's no easy way for people to know more or less how they will be charged. Is that the case? Okay, um, is there anything, anyone here who feel that can improve this situation? Uh, please raise your hand if you do. Uh, oh yes, yeah, how, how do Uber actually do this? <laughs> I just think that if it's possible for one service to offer estimates that like, like, should be possible for you to offer. Also you do, because if you call ahead and ask how much you can ask, <laughs> then they'll give you an estimate. In this city we don't. <laughs> So right. if it's yes. possible to like, offer estimates in one company, that should just be that, like, adopted as best practice in general. Okay, so do do, yeah, yes. And certainly we're looking with the small industry, with the hand legislation, to um, inform a percentage estimate range that's appropriate within the levels of these international, so that if there's a, you can use like a navigation-based app to estimate the rates going for a while. So as I understand it, Uber currently uh, contracts the Google Street, uh, the Google Map, uh, to do the estimation. Uh, and are you looking at something like that, or are you looking at you know I don't know OpenStreetMap or any other? Well, the we're just So for taxi drivers, do they usually have smartphones um, like that can run this kind of app if people have introduced it? Uh, taxis usually have like embedded systems in their cars, which includes GPS. Sure. And they have to make sure that they're not connected to the system. Uh -huh. But yeah, we don't usually ask our But, but, but it sounds good enough, actually. All you need is the starting point and the destination point by the passenger for the passenger to use their own phone right, to, to um, kind of have to estimate. So are you open to, the, to this idea? Like, if the, there is a free of charge, say, um, service that the passengers can use um, so that coupled with your GPS system to kind of just get an uh, estimate that you know, both the drivers and uh, passengers know, and there's a leeway of like potentially, I don't know, 20% more or, or something like that. Is something that you would agree with? Right. I'm not sure if this is something that's actually like said in these meetings, but like uh, that would be something we're willing to use to negotiate. Yeah, of course, of okay. course. Um, yeah. And one thing we would want uh, to make perfectly clear if there was some sort of regulated estimation on that up front is that uh, we as taxis are not in favor of surge pricing. Yeah. This current methods that are used by Uber. Yeah, we're not talking about surge pricing at all. We're just talking about a estimate range and with a kind of 20% or so um, to protect the, the consumer rights so that uh, you know both Uber and taxis don't you know take extra routes or I don't know whatever uh, thing that they're doing. And uh, is the people here generally in favor of this idea, whether it's from Uber or yes. Oh, they do. Um, 
if the Uber driver suddenly decides to agree on a flat rate with the passenger, is that allowed at the moment for the Uber business model? No. No, so they get yeah. disqualified? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah, thank you for the input. Definitely, that's a different thing. And does the taxi association do anything if the taxi agree on a flat rate? It's up to them. Oh, it's up to them then. Yeah. Okay. It's less money in their pockets, usually, so. Oh, really? It, but it, it's surge pricing. Yeah. Oh. oh, wait, a flat rate as in a lower flat rate? Or, a or higher maybe flat a higher flat rate? It's like taking to the airport for 65 drivers. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, that's a case by case basis, yeah. right? Oh, okay. So it's a case by case basis. Okay. So it's a to the taxi. It's not a complete question. Yes. That's right. That's right. So it's possible to perhaps uh, directly contact a taxi driver that you have already ride with, exactly. right, and agree on flat rate uh, beforehand. But the association says that it's decided on case by case basis whether so. it's a good idea <laughs> or not. Uh, so, so that's an important point. Yes. But that, but but the, but that's just airport, right? Yes. And those okay. rates, you can argue, are in use in themselves because on average they're double or triple like of their costs. So they're like, they're, they're already searched <laughs> pricing. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, but they are pre-agreed. So, 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 uh, yeah, okay. Okay, well. So these two are orthogonal, right? If you already agreed on a flat rate, and this doesn't apply uh, anymore, whether it's Uber or taxi. But if this is applied, then it kind of assumes that it's metered uh, in some way, whether it's through GPS or some other means. Is that correct? OK, that's great. Um, so that seems like a pretty good bunch of ideas to, to follow through. Uh, and so finally, we have one uh, last contention point, which is search pricing. Uh, would Uber like to explain uh, a little bit uh, about uh, the search pricing, which the online participant says sometimes gets double or triple or whatever uh, uh, according to the current traffic, and the algorithm they say is not very transparent about it. So that, does Uber want to explain a little bit more how search pricing is um, understood uh, by Uber? Well, I mean, if you go on.
here in the city. Um, Uber places a burden on the public road system without that same license and fee to help to uh, be back to the maintenance of that infrastructure. Well, the drivers pay taxes as private car owners and citizens, so that they are just exercising their right to use their own private vehicle on the roads, which they do pay, pay taxes to do so. And it gives them income, which gives them more capital to spend in your city as well. Yeah, well, but I mean, let's go back to the topic of surge pricing, which <laughs> was something that people clearly have uh, strong opinions of. Yes? I would challenge whether surge pricing, I, I, I would challenge what you were saying about surge pricing. Yes, please. Um, and, and I would really suggest because I really think that's surge pricing is actually helps to get more drivers um, into the city and towards the technology. As it's For raining it's or, okay. Yeah. Right, so what you're saying is that uh, the demand is high when it's congested or it's raining or whatever, and it attracts more drivers on the road, which actually makes it more congested, not less. Uh, that's your point. Uh, do you ever have anything uh, to offer about this observation? That's a very complex issue. Um, I think Google would argue that we are simply responding to the natural electric flows of an urban environment. Um, if you want less people on the roads at certain times, companies could uh, be more flexible about the hours at which they operate. Um, people could offer uh, uh, businesses can invest outside the downtown core and increase the variety and you know, availability of jobs throughout uh, the urban environment and not concentrating in one in certain areas. So these are, these are issues that uh, the use of Uber is not a cause of the output of broader systemic issues around how we operate our city. Okay. Yes. I'd also like to raise the uh, allegations that you raised in a number of venues um, concerning the ability of Uber drivers to manipulate um, the surge price rate um, to uh, effectively increase their cost of drives to a certain level of bid so that they can then take advantage of that increase. Cost. And I was wondering um, if the, 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 the company would be, would be willing to share data with the government um, so that the government could ensure that these services would be like the so I hear two main points. I just want to recheck with everybody. The first one is I hear Uber saying that there are uh, multiple factors uh, affecting search pricing, including demand weather, road, whatever um, other uh, situations around, uh, and it's complicated, uh, and, but there is, of course, data and um, you know, evidence that you use to calculate that model, and we're also hearing from the civil society that this is being less transparent than they would feel like, like people would feel like if it's uh, shared with the public the data that uh, people will understand uh, how, what, or whether uh, people are manipulating these search uh, prices and whether it actually increase or decrease congestion because then we can compare that data to the public data we have around the roads and around the congestion so we can know uh, actually uh, you know how the model that Uber currently uses helps or detracts from the environment so um, it, and I'm sure it will also help the, the taxi drivers as well if you have a more complete understanding about the demand and the supply of the uh, total uh, driving po uh, population. So th th does Uber um, agree to, to um, such a data sharing plans uh, with the public? Uh, in aggregate, of course, we're not asking about individual rights, but in aggregate. And if not, why? Commercially sensitive data. Commercially sensitive information. Is sensitive? Commercially. A commercial sort of sensitive. How uh, would you like to elaborate on that? It's uh, why we are a competitive business. It's uh, the value we've created. Okay, um, and but you think that, but do you think it would be helpful to for the public to trust you more, or you know all the other things that we've already checked? I think we would consider it. 
Okay, you, you would consider it. <laughs> okay. We, we, um, we, need, we need clarification of not being, um, not being used to advantage competitive businesses such as Okay, okay. Yes, or sorry. Taxi. Yeah. Or, yes. yeah. <laughs> so, from the Uber incident, uh, I would say that Toronto is an innovation economy and to ask a company for its information that could prevent it from being less innovative is a bad signal to send to other firms that might want to operate in the city, and this is part of our economic development plan. Um, and the other, the other point that I would make uh, just uh, about surge pricing is that surge pricing increases the price for drivers to respond and provide better service. Um, otherwise, you can get to if you are kind of overly sensitive to the price, you can choose public transit or some other form of transportation or try your best in the cab uh, in a rainstorm, uh, which you probably will be able to do. Okay. Well, um, so, so do anyone have anything to add to this sentiment? Yes. So yes. I, I would just argue that the city planning was also contributing to congestion, uh, and you know subway lines are not uh, that accommodating. If you try to get on one, it's pretty tough. In rush hour, and Uber is offering a service to help people escape that uh, psychological torment. Well, we were wondering if there was some way that we could leverage the academic research that we need to combine our. So uh, just to clarify some terminology, when you say sensitive, you mean that it is sensitive to your competitors. If your competitors yeah. have access, it yeah. will affect your profitability. You don't mean it in the sense of privacy sensitivity, yeah. oh. right? Uh, okay. <laughs> 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 um, so I think the other thing that we need to do is to have a better understanding of what um, <laughs> specifically because our business model is based on the idea of providing excellent jobs and stable jobs, uh, we call those uh, non-precarious jobs to our workers, as well as helping people get around the city in uh, a safe manner. And that is, our, that is our business model. It's not about manipulating traffic or trying to find the best ways around problems or charging people more when there's crises, stuff like that. We're just about getting people to where they want to go <laughs> while also providing excellent jobs for our uh, drivers. So we would be quite happy to release the de-identifying data as long as it doesn't negatively impact our passengers okay. or our drivers. Right, there, there's someone online that said there is an open transport partnership or sharedstreets.io uh, that the taxi uh, companies around the world are using to share this data. And the same person also online uh, said to asking the scholars here um, that the Seattle Department of Transportation actually already worked with the Uber Seattle branch uh, to share that data. 
uh, with the Seattle city government. At the moment, it's only in pilot in Seattle and not other North American cities. Uh, but I would like to ask if, first, whether um, the academics here think it would be a good idea to combine those two data and what kind of research that one can have on environmental congestions. Uh, and the second, whether uh, Uber thinks it's worth expanding from Seattle to Toronto. Uh, so first, the, the academics do you have anything to input? some inroads uh, into this data sharing uh, initiative and also that people can have a much more uh, you know um, actual idea of how search pricing affects the environment and so on which is I think what everybody online and also here cares about so would Uber like to make some uh, remarks about the timeline and our commitment that you have both with the academic community and with the wider uh, open share suite uh, community about the Toronto data. I mean, I don't know if I want to speak to anything that Uber specifically. Just your general uh, ideas. I would argue that like, as, a, as a government, as a city, there's already a huge amount of collected data on congestion, uh, road usage, uh, mobile shares. Um, and to, to put that onus on a private organisation to share their data when a huge amount of the issues of congestion are sort of apathy or political will of decades in the city towards proper infrastructure uh, and uh, a sort of claim to the will of, of a small minority of a very aggressive and loud driver representatives in the city cause much more of the issues that, uh, that we see now than simply drivers in the new And I wouldn't see the value to an extent of giving more data to a city that has largely ignored the data that's happened. But on, on, on the other hand... <laughs> <laughs> on, on the other hand, on, on the other hand, I just would like to pander now. <laughs> on the other hand, you also said that if you release this data, Lyft will gain a competitive advantage. So obviously, it's useful to to Lyft, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So if Lyft also released this data to you, does that you know kind of balance the things out? Just want to be careful that you're not punishing an innovative solution for a systemic problem. So I think that's the issue that we're talking about. There's a wider systemic issue of public transportation that needs to be figured out. And to just put the onus and responsibility on the private organization doesn't actually solve that issue. It just crushes innovation, innovation and, and private so what I'm hearing is that, of course, uh, at the moment you're saying what you're doing in Seattle, you're not currently committed to do the same with Lyft and the taxis uh, in the Toronto area. What I'm also hearing is that the taxi uh, people would like to join the pilot even before <laughs> Uber and Lyft joins <laughs> uh, as kind of a demonstration of a uh, viable co co collaboration with the city government, but I also hear that people here generally feel that such a partnership, once it's uh, visible in a way that a citizen can access, that maybe Uber and Lyft would like to consider the de degree in which that you will want to participate, maybe not with all the data, with a sample or things like that. Uh, is there something that we can all live with, like to, in the point of search pricing and data sharing? Yes? Sadly, we cannot live with that. Um, no, with please. The data of all the participants in this area, uh, we think it won't create a fair enough picture to make any actual progress until it's done. Okay. So um, we will have to share our data, but we don't think it's going to be useful to just have one side, but okay. have at least three or four sided issues. Okay. So like three or four sides of the issue. That sounds actually pretty good. So um, maybe we can convene another uh, multi-stakeholder panel specifically on data sharing after this. Uh, would you be willing to, to attend? Okay. 
All right, uh, and we're at time. Well, I'm just showing it's two hours. But anyway, uh, we're, we're at time, so thank you for participation in this consultation, and we have a clear action item to follow through, and please uh, respond to the online collaborative notes uh, with the relevant research, as well as the current regulation uh, that you have mentioned, any URL, any citation, that will be very useful for the civil society here to develop more um, awareness and even activism uh, around this kind of um, uh, evidence that's shared by everybody. And we'll have another data sharing agenda uh, consultation meeting uh, by the DOT, uh, expected maybe a month or so from now, and we will all uh, receive the emails letters about today's uh, consensus points. And thank you all for attending. In the, in the actual Uber uh, consultation in Taiwan in 2015, actually we, we see people literally uh, shouting at each other. Uh, and, and, and like, uh, like yeah, there's multiple very confrontational moments. And uh, had I, you know, I, I'm sit sitting with the sitting plan, uh, usually my facilitation style is that I like quietly uh, walk toward a person and put a hand on their shoulder and things like that. But uh, I, I can also do this through uh, like voice tonal modulation, which is what I did <laughs> three years ago. Uh, and it is the facilitator's role. And we also have co-facilitators uh, around the, the stage, uh, usually go zero volunteers, so they can also calm people down uh, if needed. Uh, and the idea, very simply put, is that we let each speaker be fully listened before the next speaker speaks. Uh, and uh, if anyone wants to uh, interrupt, uh, because it's actually, um, I, I usually just say, you know, I, I can't hear two voices at the same time. I have a hearing problem, right? So, so, so it's impossible for me to hear two voices at once. So uh, we will hear someone fully, and then someone else will can speak uh, exactly as, as how they want, including the online people. So that's my usual facilitation style. Uh, there's a book called Dynamic Facilitation that explains this uh, idea. No, um, not, not really, because um, what, what, what people have in, in writing, really, um, is, is kind of already there. Right, because that's the police part, that's the collective informed material part. And we also send, if there's any written statements in the fact-finding stage, we also send that to everybody. So it, it, it doesn't you know, matter, because uh, you can print everything out, uh, and it's all in everybody's printout, so you don't have to read that aloud. Uh, Uber, in the actual case in 2015, did its own analysis on police data, uh, trying to put a different angle interpretation on things. Uh, and then we allow them to print it and then put on everybody's table so that they don't read that aloud. Uh, and um, as time goes by, more people learn to use that tactic. But, so it kind of balances each other out, but people don't speechify things because it's on everybody's table anyway. Yes? Um, so one thing I noticed as a taxi yes. is as soon as the Uber Institute started talking, yeah. I really wanted to accuse them of like, Oh yeah. Oh so, yes. Is that, uh, or like that could be like maybe the civilian people are actually like Uber employees or something. Mm, maybe. Or like mm. um, the government just granted a, a yeah. giant thing. Like how do you, is, is there any way to control people accusing others of being bought? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, so uh, basically we publish the background and qualification of all the attendants. Uh, aside from the civil society people who came here because of the merit of their, um, um, yeah, uh, of their statements. So for these parts, it's easier to handle because we, we publish the entire credentials and things like that. And for this, actually, people here already earned the, the merit of resonating with everybody, right? They are the people who presented the sentiments that everybody agrees with. And so even if they're kind of paid by Uber, at least they're paid by Uber to present something that even the anti-Uber people agree with. And so that kind of earned them the, the seat. Yeah, that's the idea. 
Yes. Do you ever get to address it under the consent statement? Yes, we, we do. So, uh, but not, not usually in the consultation, in the initial consultation meeting. Sometimes uh, we identify the divisive statements and people do want to innovate on it, but we don't force that through. And we don't have time this time. Uh, if we have two hours, we actually will have uh, time to go through. Actually, search pricing is already a divisive statement. And usually we can handle maybe one or two divisive statements, but that's only after checking the facts and feelings of the consensus statements. Uh, and sometimes the most divisive statements is his own follow-up meetings. Uh, in terms of NCII, uh, there's another follow-up meeting that deals specifically about uh, the timely removal, I think, of uh, intimate images in uh, online service providers without impacting freedom of speech in general. And, and that is very divisive and that warrants its own meeting. That may need clarification. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, it, yes, it does. But but I, I I don't I don't I don't read that part aloud this time because it doesn't really make sense to read that aloud. <laughs> but but yes, uh, for areas of uncertainty that are actually highlighting areas of uncertainty, we do honor that in our slides, but not this time because obviously. <laughs> Yeah, and, and also um, there's also agree because I think it's a fact and agree because I don't know whether it's a fact but it resonates with me. And there's also two kind of agree, two kind of disagree and I'm sure in past are two kinds as well. Uh, we find that the interface gets somewhat complex due to that. Uh, so um, there's a prototype that requires two taps and the, the second tap is optional. Um, but we can get into a lot of details. <laughs> but we tested a lot of uh, Uber interfaces. So this one is, of course, not the final one. Well, it's open source anyway, so feel free to implement things. Uh, and the translation thing is actually new, so that people from different cultures and different languages, they can automatically translate each other's sentences. That's also new. Uh, and so, yeah, the Uber um, consultation actually uh, started one week uh, before we realized we need a mobile interface, a responsible interface for police, which used to be desktop only. Uh, and so it ran for like three days or four days. And then we worked with Colin and Tim, Chris and so on on the mobile interface and rolled out the mobile interface because we realized that most drivers are on mobile. So um, because it's open source technology, anytime you feel that you want a different input modality or things like that, you can do that. And there's a bunch of people in, I think, Brazil or something uh, that use Slackbot actually to interact with police and not at all through the web, uh, which allows for more. Uh, conversational um, approaches. I, I don't have a lot of details, but it's very customizable. Yeah. Yes? Uh, my question is around uh, how to facilitate change techniques in order to help people understand the consequences of their actions. Because I'm not sure that it's just about the consequences of their actions. Right, so uh, usually we, we abstract to common values. Right. Uh, as that, that's actually the only thing I've done so far <laughs> during the, the facilitation, to abstract to the values that people all care about without specifying over-specific uh, solutions. But if there is a clear division, uh, then I make sure to acknowledge both sides are important, that both sides are uh, born out of you know, authentic feelings, about feeling something that is important. And it's important to acknowledge both sides before moving on with the abstraction. Otherwise, people feel that I am just watering down or you know, uh, you know, making people's voice um, minuscule or unheard. And so basically, even if they get heated or angry, like in the time zone uh, cons consultation uh, or collaborative meeting in the PO system, uh, it's important to fully hear your positions before moving on to abstraction. So again, to, to fully hear it, I think is more difficult when things get divisive because you have to mentally absorb most of the um, 
attacks uh, and making sure that attacks is always to the facilitator and not to anybody else. So that sometimes I had to physically stand between the two sides that are uh, abusing each other verbally. And so to make sure that any negative energy is directed toward me personally and not to the other side. And then I turn to the other side to make them fully heard. They're not allowed, they're not to uh, interrupt each other. I will repeat what I've heard in an emotionally neutral way, as I did, and then people are asked to respond to those points and not the uh, originally charged points. Yeah, we usually have co-facilitators. That's our main way of capacity building. Uh, it used to be that mentor Jacqueline Tsai is sitting on my side when I was still uh, her understudy. And I do the facilitation, but I'm not at all an expert in law and regulations at that time in public administration. So she would just whisper to me. <laughs> yeah, uh, like what, what's the relevant code, what's the relevant regulation, what's the relevant person to call at this point. So I'm like life coached by, by Jacqueline. And then, <laughs> and then when I become the minister and uh, for example, we have um, Sunny Lin, um, you know, facilitating for the social enterprise setting. She is a social entrepreneur herself, but she's less versed uh, in the dynamic involved in the public sector's view on impact investment, uh, you know, pay for success and things like that. So I, I whisper to her uh, as she facilitates the meeting. And, and so this kind of pair uh, facilitation, I think, uh, really is the only way aside uh, from just keep playing back videos and <laughs> I challenge myself to do better. Uh, it is almost like mentorship uh, so far. That's the way we do capacity building. And in the pre-meetings, we actually do mocks uh, like this so, uh, to prepare for the worst. And, and we, we do the, the same for PO meetings also. So for the PO meetings, um, sometimes when we go to a more strange area, <laughs> like uh, the one about the remote island of the Dongsha Island, nobody knows anything about Dongsha Island uh, when the, when the uh, request came in for facilitation. So we stay in Kaohsiung the night before and people simulated just like the role playing, all the different sides of the things and just use publicly useful information and uh, prepare for the worst, like <laughs> just just verbally, uh, you know, amplify the messages and so on. And so that even if the things gets heated the next day, uh, actually the rehearsal is more heated. So <laughs> so the facilitator is mentally shielded <laughs> from the from the attacks uh, from the real stakeholders. And so far that has also worked really well. All right. Um, and so we are almost at time. So we have. Time for another few questions. If there's anyone who would like to share your feelings. Uh, this is more of a question of preparing for this, and you kind of spoke about it a little bit like you were talking earlier today, but how do you make sure that you're not overwhelming people with questions? Right, so the answer is different from each uh, part. For the government, it's very easy because uh, as the digital minister, uh, other than the president and the premier, <laughs> anyone else in the government system, if I send a meeting uh, request, they will come. And, and that is the, the kind of binding power as the minister. Uh, and uh, the academics, usually, uh, they are well respected. They have published already uh, on this very topic. So they're always very eager to share their research. Uh, our main problem, of course, is to rehearse with them a little bit to speak in layperson's language. We have to do pre-interviews to make sure that they don't use overly technical knowledge, uh, that people are not common knowledge uh, and things like that. Uh, but usually the academics are also kind of easy because uh, once you know a few um, 
right people in the right department, they will be able to suggest think tanks and academics and so on, which then refer to one another, where you just look at the citation and the uh, records uh, of public uh, journals and things like that. And usually in cases like this, where it's live streamed, uh, the professors are usually all very enthusiastic of sharing their research, which may be very obscure, right? So, so it gets them more credibility. The private sector side is the most difficult. Uh, Sometimes people do boycott uh, consultation meetings because they feel they are not in the pre-meetings or they feel that they want to have 24 representatives because there's one tax association in each city and nobody can speak for everybody else and, and things like that. So we, there, that needs a lot more pre-arrangement and usually we do that by inviting us to our pre-meetings. So uh, the weekly pre-meetings are the, in, are the way where we figure out the community's uh, kind of acceptable ranges and the private sector's acceptable ranges of um, how many people to come, what are the main condition topics, how to set a scope, how to phrase the uh, problems neutrally, and so on. And we found that the food actually is the main uh, contributor. Uh, every time they come to the uh, retail and uh, small hackathon, there's usually pizza or really good food prepared by our chef and things like that. And once they come for the food, they stay for the food and <laughs> and, and they're able to, to linger much longer than they originally prepared. Uh, and, and, then, and then gradually build report so that people can see that this is really a way for people to put down their differences and focus on the few things that people can actually uh, improve. But that usually takes easily months, like five pre-meetings, four pre-meetings. These are very usual. In the Uber case, the preparation is still in three months. So uh, yeah, it, it does take some time. Yeah. So any other guess? Yes, so uh, yeah, it's it's almost second nature to me now, so it's all in my mind. But uh, but basically, it, it is a few key questions, right? Like, is it is it? Do you have any personal experience to share? That is one uh, key phrasing um, that separates the um, objective part with the reflective part. Because when people relate about a personal experience. Uh, they automatically enter into a mode where they talk about something that people can also relate to in a factual way. If people keep saying, you know, I feel very strongly about this or that, without ask, without you know uh, divulging uh, what the personal experience that backs this highly interpretative statements, then there's no way for other people to relate. So in the first half of consultation, what I'm doing is essentially uh, releasing. The, the you know cathartic energy <laughs> of the interpretative uh, or, or reflective part and try to get people to reveal the facts and their own experiences and in the case of academic the previous research they have done in a, a human understandable way uh, that people can uh, be on the same page of facts so uh, periodically I will ask questions like so this is what we collectively understand of the situation of this aspect so far. Are people okay with it? And if people are okay, we understand the objective part is uh, reached. And then we start asking, so how do you feel about it? And so on. So um, it is very nuanced, uh, but basically we don't, uh, in my mind, I hear an interpretation that is not supported by a objective fact or experience, or if I hear a feeling that could require more experience, uh, then I asked uh, facilitative questions that ask people to go back to the earlier stage. And once people contribute on that stage for a sufficiently long time, that I feel that people are on the same page, we collectively move to the next stage. So that's what happens online as well, but in the offline it's more subtle. Yeah. So this whole process um, seems like a lot of work, but it Yes. Together yes. And my, my, my question is around, is there a tension between that compromise that has been created with such, such care and work over time and the people involved in it with people who have not been involved um, who may 
um, have a, a non-deliberated opinion about something. Very much so, very much so. Yes, and there is a strong tension, yes. How do you resolve that tension? So, um, to be honest, back in 2015, we're not very good at resolving that tension. Uh, and we, I, I would like to think we have improved now. Uh, but uh, in 2015, the VTAWA-Uber deliberation suffered from three things. Uh, the first thing is that we did not involve people in the south of Taiwan, mostly because Uber is not operating there at the moment. But taxi associations there feel excluded because afterwards, after we reached the consultation and ratified it like everything, uh, Uber would be able to legally operate in southern Taiwan as well because, well, they are ratified, right? But then the southern Taiwan tax system feel, feel very angry because they've never been brought to the table at all, right? And, and so that is one shortcoming that we now work through regional innovation and tours and so on to remedy that. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that we involved at that time only national but not municipal civil servants. And so the municipal civil servants feel also excluded because they have to basically implement whatever consensus is reached by the national ministries. And it's pretty good you know, consensus, but they don't feel that way. So, so, so the different levels, uh, national and municipalities, uh, the tension is, I would argue, actually higher than the southern uh, taxi companies. And that is why the participation officer in Tainan and other municipality is very important because we then have a direct uh, methodological transfer and report between the two levels. Uh, but at that moment, uh, again, in the cities like Taoyuan and New Taipei City and so on, um, they don't, they are not exactly 100% happy with this centralized way of policy making that involves their constituents but without the career public servants. Um, and, and, that's, uh, and the third thing is that because it's done with Gov Zero volunteers at uh, the Ministry of Cyberspace Law at the time, and, and a lot of uh, enthusiastic civil servants with doubles as Gov Zero participants, um, the know-how is not transferred. Uh, there's no devolution uh, into the township, city, as well as agency level. It is all central administration, ministerial level uh, people that knows how to run this process. And so when people see that it's really working after Uber, Airbnb, in quite a few cases, sometimes you know the individual agencies, the directors start asking them, hey, the VTOM method really works. Why don't we run VTOM method on such and such? And they would say, we have no idea how to run it. Uh, and, and the same for the municipalities as well. So it creates kind of a, a, another tension, like uh, we uh, say VTOM works so well, but then it works on so few cases. And the reason why is that people, uh, again, the know-how is not evolved. The capacity uh, building in 2015 is essentially what we say in information science, an oracle, right? <laughs> or a, uh, a plug-in <laughs> that just magically works, but uh, nobody other than the central administration knows how it works. Uh, and so, which is why, again, we think it's very important to do capacity building uh, as soon as possible after 2015, because we also see that creates a lot of tension of the so-called popularity and success of V-Taiwan and the reality that most, uh, you know, down-to-earth cases, the people just don't know how to use this methodology at all. Yeah. So there is a tension to us now. So, yeah, we have five more minutes, or we can take an early break. Maybe we can take an early break. Okay, so, yeah, so, Thank you for participating in this uh, consultation and then we'll move on to the stage four in 350.